While the truncheon may be used in lieu of conversation, words will always retain their power. Words offer the means to meaning, and for those who will listen, the enunciation of truth. And the truth is, there is something terribly wrong with this country, isn't there? Yeah. And it's us. We're back. We're doing things. Hello. Yep. Sorry about a week, a week off. Logan. Being Graffin again. Back at you. Rangers Radio. Episode 6. <laughs> back at you. <laughs> In the hood of the internet. <laughs> keep on keeping on. We're going to be uh, bringing you the show by any means necessary. And uh, <laughs> today's show is brought to you by the power of Linux. Because it's awesome. Yay. No, um, my machine died last week. Um, All SSD right. failed. So, um, oh, no. Kevin is a geek. Sent me a little pack, a care package of three SSDs. Oh, nice! Not That's SSDs. Cool. Um, three, three hard drives. Yeah. Um, they are so they're they're like moving part hard drives. Um, but it, it got <clears> this <throat> machine up and running, and I thought I could go and get Windows reinstalled. Or and then I thought, nah, this is an Ubuntu moment. So I have free operating system and free software. So everything on this show that's being recorded. I don't know about your machine. What are you using? Oh, I'm, I'm on Windows, but then again, you know, oh. gaming and stuff. Yeah. It's like, I've got one Windows machine, but everything else is Linux. Mm. So this little laptop is just Linux, and just open source software, including Mumble. Again, provided by yep. Kevin is a Geek. Kevin is a Geek is making this week's show happen, entirely. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much. Even though we, And I did lose some links that people sent me, because they were all on that machine. Oh. And I've, nev I've never seen an SSD go down like that, and I don't know why. I think it's because the cat slept on top of the keyboard, and hmm. the machine itself overheated. Maybe. So I did think it was the hard drive controller that burnt out, but I had another. I, I got another hard drive off Kevin, and he, he just uh, it just fired up. So it must be the SSD, and I don't know why it's dead. And must I can't. Be the SSD, I, yeah. I can't even read it, which is weird. Hmm. And I don't know why. Which is a shame because it was there was a lot of interesting data on there. Uh, so apologies to anybody that sent in any links. I, I included the one or two that I thought I could remember. So yeah. if you had sent me a link for episode six, um, and it isn't on here, my apologies and feel free to send it again. It's not because we didn't want to include it. It's because literally lo I lost everything. Um, the only thing I had left running to download the new Linux image on was my other laptop, which only has an 80 gig hard drive. Mm -hmm. So it's not something I store anything on. It's just like literally an operating system and a means of looking at the web and downloading stuff. So, hmm. yes. So, um, so this is episode six. We're back again. Apologies for the for the week off, um, but we're going to go straight into the news. Um, and I'll insert a news jingle of our choice here. <laughs> <laughs> I always like. I, I wish the little tones from Good Morning in Vietnam, where he switches over on his first show, the little sort of pipe sounds, was a bit longer. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I, I love that bit. Anyway, so good evening, Internet, and uh, thank you for listening to this. We're still not getting a lot of downloads though, so people are not breaking the first rule of Fight Club, which is unfortunate. <laughs> we need a bigger listenership. We need these yeah. ideas and these bits of news to get out further. That's the point of the news. But thank you to everybody that listened, and thank you to everybody that uh, continues to listen. And uh, But it's more people than in the IRC. So I don't know who the 30-odd people are. Because we've got about 15 people in the IRC. Regularly. Yep. About that. Um, and getting about four, up to 40 downloads or 40 watches on YouTube. I don't know how many we're getting off the archive.org, which is the other place you can get this. So if you want to join it, um, it's uh, feel free to go into the IRC, which is webchat.freenode.net, and log into the room hash R4NGER5, or go to Rangers Tube, R4NGER5 Tube, which is where all our new stuff is. Um, still catching up with the video thing. Again, everything's been down, but we'll get some more stuff out to you. Um, oh, um, Digital Whiskey had an idea, I don't, and, I, and I haven't had a chance to spring oh, it yeah. on you. Um, where where I'm putting together the prepper's larder. Yes. We come up with some recipes or some decent food to eat with what's in the prepper's larder. Yeah. That's so a good this idea. week it's um, rice mixed in with chicken soup. So that's literally take a serving of rice, um, soak it overnight so you can save on the fuel. 
and then add a whole can of chicken soup to it and that'll feed two people and it's really nice actually mm -hmm. there's another thing you can do um you can make um campfire kedgeri which i think you've had i've had that yeah um so you boil a, a boil uh, two eggs per person do two persons worth of rice and mm -hmm. add a can of mushroom soup and um chop up the eggs and get that through and then add a can of tuna and yeah, that will make good. that will make way more kedgeri than two people need because i think last time mm -hmm. we had it i was living off grid yeah. and we couldn't finish the pot of kedgeri i think we, we couldn't, had no. two servings each and we were just like rolling around going now i don't bend in the middle <laughs> <laughs> this is food cover time yeah so uh oh there's activity in the irc there is got method and kevin at the moment method and kev so um speaking of that i was was thinking on the whole um lard, emergency larder thing and i've been trying like, my emergency larder and it's worked out quite well mm. um like i've been eating from it mm. You know, on a regular basis. Just I've to had see, a few skin so like a lot, a lot of that out. stuff that was actually in the first episode of Rangers TV. It's um, gone now. Uh, I've used about six cans of that because I've been pretty poor recently. Yeah. So yeah, so a lot of that's gone, and uh, it makes for good late night snacks as well, especially cans of peaches. You're just like, oh, yeah. I want something, and I, I want it to be at least vaguely healthy. And just crack yeah. open a can of fruit and eat that straight out of the can. Yeah, but one of the things I, I think I'm going to add to it because um makes sense to add to it i'm gonna get a couple of those cheap gas burners oh the flat ones yeah the flat ones that take the aerosol style aerosol can style gas canisters now those are good um mm -hmm. they won't cook your food if it's if it's below zero yeah so if it is winter that butane is you know, to quote Bobby Hill, <laughs> my dad says butane's a bastard it's a gas. Bastard gas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really is. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, you can't get canned propane in this country, which is a real shame because that would yeah. be awesome. You know, if, if no, those little butane. stoves would use, because they would use, um, if you had a slightly different regulator, that's what I'd like to see with those flat stoves, those little briefcase stoves. You pop those open, and there's a, like a switch for butane or propane. Like a little yeah. slider switch, that'd be great. And then do can propane. A couple of the guys in the IRC were talking about Sterno. Oh yeah, them Sterno things. Yeah. Have you uh, now? Weirdly, because I now know what I'm looking at, I noticed that a lot of um, you know those sort of down market hardware stores, sort of like not not a B and Q, but you know those sort of shops that sell a bit of everything. Yeah, yeah. we've got a couple near me. Um, mm -hmm. And what it's called in the UK if you're looking for it, is chafing fuel. All right. So if you see a tin that looks like a paint can, um, and it's got chafing fuel, it's about two quid a can. So about $2.50 now in American. Um, and it will burn for two and a half hours. And you can put the lid on it and put it out. And essentially what it is, is denatured alcohol gel. You know those little... Well, it's in a gel, yeah. Yeah, you know those little uh, those little gel packets you get with military, like the Crusader cook sets. You know the the gel that you squeeze onto the cooker underneath the Crusader. Yeah, cup. of course, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's the same stuff. So if you want to yeah, buy it right. dead cheap, you want to try either, and I'm not being racist. It's just the only places I've ever heard I've ever seen these is Asian or Chinese hardware and long term food stores. Mm hmm. And I've, and unbeknownst to me, I actually have two cans of Sterno, and it's good for heating if you can close off a room. It doesn't produce any. Yeah. Um, um, you want to obviously ventilate the room from time to time, but as far as I know, it doesn't produce any uh, sort of vapors that cause you any harm. Right. It'll burn for as long as you need to. So it's good for. It was you. It's. It was also called, and this is where it goes back to like the 1920s in America, canned heat. If you've ever heard the expression, mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's Sterno. Now again, this stuff doesn't cook all that well if it's really fucking cold. Meth stuff. Burn the butane. Yeah. Meth meth will run a stove no matter what temperature it is. I've used it in all sorts of really shitty conditions. So you might want to. Well, that's you, the thing. The that's UK, my. Yeah, meth is really hard to come by in America and Canada apparently, but Sterno isn't. 
Mm -hmm. And Sterno actually well, make a really good cooking set. If you're in America, they make a good, a really great cook stove for Sterno cans. Bin the Sterno, put a little pop can so um, soda can stove on top of an upturned tuna tin to bring it to the right height, and use that if it's cold. Well, my like the backup cooking system mm. for me is um, a couple of tranches. That's yeah. my like super cold wind and, stuff. But for like and every, tranges, everything else, tranges is are much be slower than meth stoves. Yeah. And they're well, they're more they're more um, thirsty than a meth stove, but you can stop right, them. So you can switch them off. That's the advantage of a trangia. You can shut it down with the meth inside, and it will just go out. So eBay, mm -hmm. right? Just had a look on eBay. One box, thirty six cans, two hour burn time, chafing fuel. Mm -hmm. How much do you guess? How many cans was it again? Thirty six cans. <sighs> thirty quid. 25 quid fucking hell yeah you know we need to have a rangers meet where this stuff that's way cheaper in bulk we just order it we just order <laughs> it get it delivered to one person that's nearest to the to the meat and just divvy it up yeah because if it's 25 quid that's for 36 like really cans that's about 80p a can and I'd quite yeah. happily have 4 quids worth out of that I'd have five cans out of that cheap. 36 or six cans out of that 36. We perhaps, yeah. perhaps need to do that because that's how, you know, you make your money if you're running a store is that you get to buy in stupid bulk mm -hmm. and then shave money off the postage. That might be worth doing, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So chafing fuel, if you're in the UK, it's good stuff. And um, if you go uh, in the Chinese um, supermarket that I went into to buy, and I looked at the chafing fuel and thought that looks interesting, they actually mm -hmm. sold a little trivet that went over the top. All right. But I'm thinking that the nine quid stove I, I reviewed on Rangers TV, and apologies that that was a long video, but I wanted to get in all the safety stuff on that because I kept thinking of interesting things that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And it was all in different sections of it. So it is a bit rambly. But that will improve. I shall script things a bit more tightly in future. But those nine quid stoves are bomb proof. You can looks like it. You really. can you can abuse the fuck out of them, and they won't <laughs> die on you. They're really good. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and as a mount for a meth burning stove, they're quick as fuck. Those pop can stoves will boil a, a pan of water real quick. In yeah. America, they've got these. If you go into Walmart, Sterno Maker Stove Cook Set. Yeah, that is also really bomb proof for about twenty dollars. Oh wow! So if you're in America, just run to the store, and it comes with a really good cooking pan, like pasta for two size cooking pan, that all yeah. boxes up inside it, and it's absolutely mint. If you were using a, a meth burning pop stove, you'd have to raise it up a bit to get the same effect. Yeah. And Sterno's rubbish in really cold weather. I mean, I'm talking outside cold. So if you're out in the woods, Sterno Sterno isn't all that good. If you're indoors and it's cold, Sterno works mm -hmm. like a dream. So I think they're, they're, they're two things. And they used to be used for heating up curling tongs and shit like that. It was wherever <laughs> you needed to heat stuff, but you didn't have you any mains Sterno. gas or anything like that. It was kind of like um, people having off-grid gas. It was just a really cheap, easy yeah. way that you could get anywhere, any petrol station or anything. You buy a little can of Sterno and heat up what you needed to. And plenty yeah. of hobo stoves were, were the size they were. I mean, if you wanted to make a Sterno hobo stove, punch a load of holes in like a, a medium-sized can like bigger than a normal tin can, pop the sterno mm -hmm. stove at the bottom and use that as your support, and then use tent yeah. pegs to hold your, your cooking vessel at the right height. Or yeah. the sterno stove up to the right height, so it's actually going to cook it, but it works as well as anything. Anyway, mm -hmm. we are digressing, but yeah. Sterno. We haven't even started with the news yet. Yes. Yeah, I am <laughs> sorry. That's very bad of us. We're bad. And that's 30 I minutes think... we've chewed up, but yeah. Yeah, but I think that's one of the things I'd like to do is just to, with the TV show, is just to explore some cooking options <laughs> rather than um, rather than just the food options you know as well yeah. as the food options I mean sorry well, it's all very yeah, well we but yeah that. how do you cook it if everything's yeah. cut off and it's, it's about yeah. sort of getting that to uh, the next episode is fire and water nice so I'm going to look into different ignitions different ways of sorting out fire you know how you would safely use a mess stove indoors and shit like that you know so you can get mm -hmm. your shit cooked and you can get fed because being fed yeah. is you don't have to be quite as warm if you're well fed mm-hmm if you're cold and hungry, 
you'll deteriorate real rapid. Oh yeah. If you can't control, you know, you know, if you are stuck, I mean, you got. I mean, interestingly enough, because our country's been going down the to- toilet for quite a while, um, there's lots of advice for elderly people staying warm in winter. Yeah. So put on layers, stay in one room, try and heat that one room. You know, I. That's Which the is thing. depressing. Rather than we will look after you properly, here is how to survive. Here is some you just, the Antarctic type advice. You just reminded me of something, and um, I need to mention this. And I know again we're digressing just a little bit, but this is what you were talking about with the elderly people, the things mm. made for elderly people. Yeah. So I was thinking, I was I read something really interesting on Twitter a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Or so you know, though, you know those infomercials with the really terrible. With, with the items that seem really frivolous, kitchen items and home items. Oh yeah, that seem re- like a, a, um, a, a handheld device for cracking an egg with one hand. Yeah, uh, or the snuggies. You know the the <laughs> sort of blanket that you put on over the front, and you've got arms and everything. And the adverts are really terrible and show show just normal people failing at really simple things. Can't drink out. There's of a, a good cup. reason for that. <laughs> Why? There's a good reason for that. Hmm. There's a real good reason for that, and it's so, like turned my perception all, all the way around. So it makes you feel superior to the person that's in the infomercial. No, 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 no. They're not designed for able-bodied people. Ah. The the items are, des- are actually designed for people with disabilities. That's why you have an egg cracking device that only requires you to use one hand. Mm. That's why you have a blanket that you can put over the front of yourself with little fold with, with sleeves to your arms, because you might not be able to put on a cardigan by yourself. Mm. That's why you know you've got all these labour saving devices, and the reason that they have to sell them on television is because they need to make back the money, because only a small number of people actually will buy the oh. The, everyone who's disabled will buy those things, mm. but even then, that's you know a small number of things, a small number of units sold. But they still need to recoup the money. No, yeah. so they they sell them to technically lazy people as well. Ah. But that's like that's like it's flipped my my thing of the upside down now. I always wonder what devices. infomercials would look like if they were for useful products. Well, that's the thing. They are useful products, though. They're just not. Yeah, they're but I mean, sort of like for... more universally useful products. You imagine, like, yeah, someone yeah. like Dave Canterbury doing infomercials. <laughs> Need to chop oh, some man. fucker's head off with one go? Try the new cold steel cookery. <laughs> There's like loads of people missing zombies or not able to yeah. open a watermelon correctly with one go, you know, sort of like. And then, oh. gee, thanks, Dave. I wonder how I ever got along without opening up some fuckhead at my doorstep's head in one shot. Yeah. You know, just but yeah, like no. Oh yeah, but that does totally revolutionise the way you look at stuff. Yeah, it's just like I'll never look at a infomercial the same way. I won't be looking at uh, it as saying, "Oh, look at these! Look, why is it so dumb? Why are all these people failing at really simple things?" I'll be thinking to myself, "That's a really good product for a, a particular disabled person." Mm. You know, and it's it's just like I, I um. It's that privilege again. Yeah. You just don't think about what you assume things are meant for you. Yeah. You know. Anyway, we should move on to the news stories. We've rambled we enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you want to take the first one? Yeah, sure. I'll take the first one. Um, okay, so first news story. Britain's living in the EU face Brexit backlash. Leaked paper warns. British nationals living in the EU can expect a uh, post-Brexit backlash against the UK government's treatment of foreigners since the EU referendum, a leaked EU document says. An assessment of the legal impact of Britain's withdrawal obtained by The Guardian suggests that the future status of 1.2 million Britons living in the EU will be a matter for each individual member state after the UK leaves in 2019. But the document adds... Quote, the fact that it appears to be particularly difficult for foreign nationals, even if married to UK nationals or born in the UK, to acquire permanent resident status or British nationality may colour member states' a- approach to this matter. End quote. No pun intended. 
Yeah. <laughs> there has been almost a 50% increase in the number of EU citizens applying for permanent residency since the vote on the 23rd of June. The number of applications rose from 36,555 in the three months to June 2016 to 56,024 in the three months to September, according to latest figures. EU nationals say that to obtain permanent residency cards, applicants have to complete an 85-page form requiring huge files of documentation, including P60 to five years, historical utility bills, and a diary of all occasions they have left the country since settling in the UK. Some have received letters inviting them to prepare to leave the country after failing to tick a box on a form. Cross-party group of the European Parliament established a task force to investigate the complaints. Jack Cooper, her husband Patrick, um, has been told that she may have to leave the EU, the UK after Brexit. Um, da -da -da -da. Document warning of a retraction of uh, from EU countries was drawn up by European Parliament's Committee on Legal Affairs to aid the EU's Brexit negotiators and leaders of parties in the European Parliament. Uh, discussing the legal challenges of the government's use of Article 50 and how the EU will interact, interpret the Lisbon Treaty's exit mechanism in the coming negotiations. Yeah, see, I'd like to know the figures on that, you know, so if there are 1.2 million British nationals living abroad in the EU, that's just in the mm -hmm. EU, I wonder how many people are here, sort of, who are wanting to obtain residency, because I, I bet the numbers are, are fairly similar. If not, there are more Britons living abroad than there are EU nationals living here. I mean, that was the big thing about Brexit, oh, we're going to stop people coming into this country and taking our jobs. And then Which at the same we could have done anyway. And then at the same time, living on benefits. Yeah, it's like, they're going to take our jobs, but then on, I don't know. <laughs> kind of um, but uh, to be honest, really, this is, this is, this is, this is, again, our government's own fault. Uh, 100%, right? It's, it's like, this is only in response to the fact that our government has been saying, Oh well, you may, has had people saying to EU nationals. Oh well, you may have to leave Britain. Yeah, and you know, it's like you know, we got... you don't make that decision. You you wait until Brexit's happened, and it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, before you can say that. Hmm. Up until we leave in 2019, we are still members of the EU. We have to follow EU laws hmm. now. What this shows, anyway, is what we had in the first place. We had the ability to do all this stuff. The EU wasn't preventing us from doing any of these things. We've had yeah. the ability to prevent people from settling since, uh, uh, for many, many decades. We've had the ability to do it. But, you know, Brexit. We, were, we had to leave. Will of the people. Yeah. Well, I would have liked to have seen the news um, do, because they had a responsibility. You know, they always go, "It's we're here to get seek the truth. You know, that's their, their torch in the darkness. We'll bring you the actual information. Is while they were yep. doing all this, sort of say, okay, so this is what the Brexiters are saying. These are the lies. It's a lie that we're paying £350 million a week. It's a lie that we'd be able to stop a single person really coming in if we weren't, you know, that we've already agreed to let in if we left the EU. It's a lie mm -hmm. to say that the EU make us take in all these people. Yeah. Over, over to you, Boris. Oh, that man, I just, that I just... would be a lie. And Nigel Farage pontificating and going, no, Nigel, that's what we call a lie. It's not an alternative yep. truth. It's not alternative facts. It's not fake news. It's just a lie. And, you know, you don't get to refer back to that. You can talk about other things. If you don't want to say, okay, we're lying, that's fair enough. It's not in your interest to, and we'd be here all bloody day. But do you want to move on to something else? Because every time, you know, you say something and it's a lie, on the screen, taking up half the screen, will be a thing that flashes up saying, this is a lie. Yeah. And after you've stopped Indeed. speaking, and after you've gone away again, we will go over the lies that you've told us. Yeah. One of the, you know, things the, that, the short answer to this is don't lie. <laughs> I agree. I think that the the news media has kind of failed us. Yeah. By yeah. not being properly telling us about the truth. And in this 
effort to be bipartisan. Well, I, d- I don't think it was even bipartisan. I think it was heavily slanted on, you know, l- lapping up with a spoon. Um, pictures of people shaking placards and saying, "Well, oh, yeah, I think we should stop people coming into the country and, oh, mm. we need that money for the NHS. And it's like... Uh, or sensationalist, yeah. You know, that would be a lie. And just, mm. just say, I'm sorry, but every time you say something that is not true, we will have to counter it by saying this is not true. I mean, if you, they wouldn't have got away. I'm afraid the sky today is green. <laughs> quick look outside. Uh, no, it's not. You seem to be no. the only person that believes it's green. And if you try and enforce the idea that the sky is green, we'll have to say it's not. It's blue. Yeah. Or it's grey or white or whatever colour it is, but it's certainly not green. You know, and, and just say, say, I'm sorry, but that's a provable lie. You keep up with that shit, we're just going to put on screen, this is a lie. Don't need to make our anchor person get into a confrontation with you, but this will come up every time you lie, we will say, this is a lie. And every time you question our validity of a lie, we will come up with all the document documentation and information to prove that it is a lie. I, d- I really don't understand why the news wasn't empowered. I mean, all the le- some of the lefty papers, like The Guardian and stuff like that, which is probably the only online newspaper that I read, were saying this is a lie but that's an echo chamber Mm -hmm. the only people reading that are lefties you know like me you know the only people reading that are sort of people that already sort of know that that's bullshit so that needed to be a you know it uh, and i I think newspapers that say that sensationalize things like that that are going to change you know the way the country works need to print you know this is not true if it's not true you know if you actually print a lie then you then the newspaper should be held accountable for it. If you actually yeah. allow a lie to persist, like that's provably not true, then you have to take proper, not mumbling into your hand. Oh, I don't think that's entirely true, but we'll let it roll. I mean, you have to properly in the same size text that you've printed and on the same page. This is not actually true. It is in fact only 190 million, and this is all the stuff we get back for it. Yep. I just. You know, I, and then, then all of a sudden they're, they're, they're like really surprised that, oh, all the British people living abroad aren't going to be treated very well after we've treated mm-hmm. the people that are from there that live here like shit, even though we yeah. haven't even left the EU. One of the things, if I was a news reporter, right, I would be hounding Boris Johnson and Michael Gove every time I saw them. It'd be like, I just ask the same question. Yeah. So what about what about the bus? Uh, Boris Johnson, uh, what about the bus? <laughs> yeah, the bus that you're on. You could, he could have easily said, bus? I'm not riding on the bus because that's a lie. Well, no, you see, the thing is, is it, that was his party. That was his yeah. campaign. Yeah. Michael Gove, Boris Johnson were in that campaign which had that bus. Mm. They okayed that bus. So someone just made a bus and said, here, you need to ride this bus. Mm. They were in charge of that campaign. They yeah. were spearheading it. That was their decision. So Boris Johnson thought, oh yeah, no, let's give 350 million back to the NHS was a good idea to put on his bus. He okayed that lie. He knew it was a lie. He's a, he's a fucking politician. He was the mayor of City of London. He knows this. He's not fucking stupid. And I don't know, I don't care how often he does this, oh, I'm a dope yeah. thing that he does. No, he's not an idiot. He's very, he's very, very intelligent. He knows what he's doing. Oh yeah, I, I don't think uh, they expected to win. I, I, no, I, I, th- I think that was a for both Gove and um, Johnson, and possibly yeah. to a lesser extent Nigel Farage. That was just a bid to be man of a certain type, type of the people in the UK. Yeah, they, but, they were going for a bit of man of the people kind of cred, so that they could make a bid for party leadership in the Conservatives. Yeah, but we should be caught. Call- Everyone should be calling them out on that now, especially Forever. considering, especially considering that we've got the worst, the worst head of the NHS, still head of the NHS. Yeah, well we have Jeremy Hunt has been consistently terrible, being in the charge of the NHS for the last however long he's been yeah. in charge of the NHS. He's and been more than like anyone else to the point and where we like, we now no longer have and anything. We, we, it doesn't exist. There's no mental health facility in the NHS. No. Nothing. Because he's got rid of it. 
because they're, he's try, they're trying to gut the NHS. Well, the and NHS sell it off. If if you have uh, if you're mentally ill, you're screwed right now. There's no process yeah. for getting you referred to. There's no uh, mental health professionals in the NHS to speak of. And if you have a pre-existing condition, they've already farmed you out to a private practice. Mm -hmm. And there's no money to pay for that private practice. I mean, we're talking about people that charge, you know, 50 to 100 pounds an hour for counselling. Yeah. That's who you would have been referred to while the NHS, they, while they was quietly in, uh, dismantling it. And that's one of the reasons our homeless population has shot up. Because mm -hmm. people can't cope in society. They're falling through the cracks. They're being shuffled off on dole. And they're now on, they've they've fallen through that, and they're now on the streets. Yeah, you know these are people with real traumas. You know these are people because they don't care because they're the people that give them money to make things happen. On on don't have to walk around on the streets like the rest of us. Yeah, they're not potential you know uh, victims walking? of, of people. Fucking yeah, they're not walking around the city everywhere. seeing people that are homeless, thinking, oh shit, something should be done. Yeah. This isn't okay in a civilized society. They're quite, you know, but they're quite happy to line their pockets with the government trough of new building projects or new office buildings and shit like that. Yeah, and new rail systems. So anyway, and and now all of a sudden, these sort of like middle income, reg relatively wealthy people that are living abroad are now screwed because of this decision. And may I add, not one of them voted to leave the EU. Yeah, very very few people voted for Brexit that were that were living in the EU. That were British, of you know, course, so because they know they knew what it was like. They knew what would happen. You know, the I mean, imagine you've you've bought you know a fairly nice cottage out in southern France, and you're living there, and you've got the reciprocal NHS care. You're retired. You live in a nice place. You know, you've got your pension coming in, which probably goes a bit further wherever you're living. You've got decent health care because you know French health care and Spanish health care is awesome compared to ours. Mm -hmm. They'll get yep. seen really quick. The NHS will be reciprocally billed. You know, the NHS pay for those people's treatment that aren't even living in the country as mm -hmm. part of an EU arrangement, which is going away, which will go away. The French won't stand for that. The French won't no. provide healthcare for non non French nationals, and it's all going to fall apart. And and their the report acts like it's a surprise. Yeah, <laughs> like holy shit. You know, and it's been leaked. And I guarantee you that it was leaked by someone that says, I fucking told you so. And now you have something to prove it. Yeah. It's, you been, know. Le it's been leaked on purpose. Of course, of course it yeah. would, this would have just, really just got swept under the rug. Yeah. I mean, you Otherwise. know, sort of like there's this lovely bit at the end of that news story. I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead a bit, but do read it. Yeah, it's yeah. important. The, the committee also reports, while it is hoped that the challenges can be overcome, there will be an impact on the careers of British staff working within European institutions. No shit. The European Parliament, the Council, the Commission alone have 15, 1,500 British staff members. The UK withdrawing from the European will definitely have an impact on their careers, for in principles only nationals of member state can work in the EU institutions. So that's 1,500 yeah. people that are fired, but that, those are politicians. You know, they didn't name all the other people that have got part-time jobs out in Europe that are doing, you know, earning a little bit of extra money while they live in France or Spain or the other places that British people live. Yeah. You know, it adds that without a negotiating solution, the current staff could be subject to comp compulsory um, resignation. Well, mm -hmm. no shit, Sherlock. If there's no EU, the EU employees won't... <laughs> they can't work there. It's yeah. quite simple. Anyway. Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> Moving on. Uh, currently, following on to, from the mental health comment I made just earlier, um, here we go. Magic mushrooms promising uh, for treatment of depression. A hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic chemical in magic mushrooms shows that the promise shows promise for people with untreatable depression. A short study on just twelve people hints eight patients were no longer depressed after the mystical and spiritual experience induced by the drug. Yeah, well, that's not news. I mean, R. D. Lang knew that back in the nineteen sixties. Um, the yeah. findings in the Lancet Psychiatry. The, the Lancet actually has a psychiatric section. 
which is amazing because, you know, there aren't that many psychiatric professionals in the NHS anymore, showed that five mm -hmm. of the patients were still depression-free after three months. Experts cautiously welcomed the findings as promising, but not completely compelling. There have now been called calls for the drug to be tested in larger trials, which there have been since the 1960s. At the start of the <laughs> yeah. trial, nine of the patients had at least severe depression and three were moderately depressed. In one patient, the symptoms had lasted 30 years. Imagine being depressed for 30 years. I mean, I get depressed periodically, but fuck me, you know. What, how, how the fuck do you continue after that? All of them had tried at least two different treatments for depression without success. One had tried 11. Holy shit. Imagine her being reassigned to different pills that take a long time to get into your system, like six months. Prozac yeah. takes months to start to have an effect. And that's our most commonly issued antidepressant. Um, the study at Imperial College London initially gave patients a low dose of psilocybin, the hallucinogenic chemical found in magic mushrooms. Um, to test for safety, they were given a very high dose equivalent to a lot of mushrooms, the researchers said. The psych psychedelic experience lasted up to six hours, peaking after the first few. I can agree with that. I've had them. I felt pretty mm -hmm. relaxed afterwards, I tell you. Um, and we may need a freely growing source of antidepressants <laughs> in future yeah. years. And was accompanied by classical music uh, and followed by psychological support. Um, Dr. Robin Carhart... Harris, one of the researchers, said these experiences with psilocybin can be incredibly profound and sometimes people have what they described as a mystical or spiritual type experience. Well, no shit. Imagine suddenly not being too attached to all the things that make you depressed and seeing the world in a larger perspective, yeah. which is what it does to you, which is why you come up with all these groovy ideas when you're on a magic mushroom high. I thoroughly recommend it. Don't take a lot and have someone with you that isn't doing them, because that will help. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, most patients had a rapid dip in in their depressive symptoms, with a predictable with predictable side effects including anxiety, nausea, and headaches. Yeah, maybe. Seeing effect sizes of this magnitude is very promising, mm -hmm. and there are very large effect sizes in any available treatment for depression. So basically, when you treat depression with drugs, each human mind is completely unique, which is why being horrible and yep court creating war and rape and pillage and murder are such bad things because that person will never exist as they are again when you do mean shit to them um, and exactly. we now need larger trials to understand whether the effects we saw in this study of it translate into long term benefits because what um, psychiatric drugs do is depress certain areas of the brain now it's not always the same area of the brain that's mm -hmm. causing the depression it's not the same thought processes or the same trauma that's causing that depression and those traumas can be triggered by different parts of the brain going into overdrive so that can be something can somebody can say something to you or you can find yourself in a similar situation or even just like a piece of music can push you into that depression because it was it, you know it was it was a key indicator of when you were last depressed and it triggers that depression response which causes bits of your brain to shut down and you not to respond to outside stimulus and shit like that you just go into a cycle of shutting down various responses to things and it's it, 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 it's it's mm -hmm. not good for you so when you issue someone with a drug, unless they're, the cause of their depression is the same as the, what that drug's treating, it's not going to work. Whereas psilocybin sort of redefines your place in the universe, if you like, which I could have told them that for free. They could yeah. save themselves a lot of money. Um, <laughs> and fellow researcher, Professor David Nutt, who is a fucking hero, and is a hero of like saying, we could try some different yes. shit. And has been. We've reported on him before, and he's got ra roundly fucked over for it. Um, said thoughts could become locked in mm -hmm. in an overly self-critical and negative mode in depression, and it was thought the drug acted as a lubricant for the mind that liberates the patient, which is basically what I just said. And he said psilocybin targeted the receptors in the brain that normally responded to the hormone serotonin, which was involved in mood, not you know the part of your brain that sometimes is triggered when you when some people are depressed this just like increases the serotonin level so you chill out a bit which is why people smoke weed and why they do acid yeah. you know because they want to chill the fuck out from all their problems and how oh, yeah. the study is anything but clear cut is in short of it so they're saying yes it worked it provably worked for everybody that did it but we didn't test enough people and that, that's basically their problem. They're not saying we will now do a test of 2,000 people that are depressed and see what happens because they know it would just unlock a whole bunch of people and it's really hard to patent because it just grows naturally. Yeah. You know, this is a natural plant that exists on the earth. All you've got to do is provide the environment and psilocybin mushrooms will grow. And we can grow it really, really cheaply. Yep. We can grow them essentially off cow shit. 
in vast numbers. Mm -hmm. And you only need about 20 mushrooms to push you into that nice trippy place. So you could get home from work thinking I'm a bit depressed and like reassign your perspective on the world for a few hours and go, okay, I feel a lot better now in the way that people smoking weed do. Because mm -hmm. um, psilocybin and um, tetrahydrocannabide, which is the active ingredient in weed, That's do the, the same the, thing. THC then. Yeah. Yeah. So the researchers told the BBC it's possible that all improvement was down to the placebo effect. Depressed people don't really respond to the placebo effect, if, especially if you tried 11 different psychiatric drugs. You're just going to think one more fucking thing. Yeah. So you And you don't have a mystical experience on the placebo effect. It might stop pain and shit like that, but that's bollocks. Those people had a mystical experience and went, oh, fuck, it's not all that important. I shall chill out. Um, and all in, uh, and <laughs> the, though the duration and, of the benefit and change of that was is suggested something else was going on. Yeah, I improved. I didn't get depressed for three months after I looked at the universe slightly differently and had a mystical experience. No shit, Sherlock. And Dr. Carr at Harris said, this isn't a magic, yep. uh, magic cure and we shouldn't infer too much until larger trials have taken place. And Professor Nutt said, simply being able to perform the study using a hallucinogenic drug was a landmark and he criticised the Kafkaesque restrictions that made research difficult. Professor Nutt, who was fired as the government's drug advisor for his outspoken views, said red tape meant that it cost £1,500 to dose each patient, when any sane world, it might have cost 30 quid. Professor Philip Cohn of the University of Oxford said the yep. key observation might, that might eventually justify the use of a drug like psilocybin in the treatment-resistant depression is the demonstration of sustained benefit in patients who have previously experienced years of symptoms despite conventional treatments, which makes longer-term out outcomes particularly important. The data at three-month follow-up are comparatively short time in patients with excess, extensive illness dura duration are promising but not completely compelling. So they had one dose of psilocybin. They were okay after three months. Don't you think another dose of psilocybin mm -hmm. if they decided to sort of like dip in or got a bit depressed, considering it would cost fuck all to give it to them, might be an idea. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's a link. There, that's the whole story, pretty much. There's no point going to the link, but essentially, they gave people magic mushrooms and they cheered the fuck up. Um, and they decided that one dose would have been pretty enough. Much. Uh, just insane. And, and Professor Nutt has basically said shit like this for years. I mean, it was one of the very first stories we did on Rangers Radio. Yeah, uh, it was. and you know when he said, you know, ecstasy is less dangerous than horse riding. Which is essentially, and did yeah. no more damage to the community. People dropping an E on, on a weekend actually lowered crime instead of them getting absolutely pissed on legal drugs. <laughs> and, and he got fired for that. Because yeah. that's not what the government wanted to say. Because it suits the government to have inc incredible yeah, levels of tax on, on alcohol and tobacco and all the shit we're allowed to take. Whereas taxing things that you can grow in your own home yep. is not a good idea. I mean, literally, growing mushrooms is a piece of piss. Growing psilocybin mushrooms is exactly the same as mm -hmm. growing any other mushroom, except that you get off your tits on it. And getting off your tits when you've got yep. a lot of hassle in your life is a good idea. You know, yeah. take take a note of all the things that are depressing you and, and, and get gone for a bit. You know, rather than drink yourself to death, you know, maybe once a month, you know, chew up a few mushrooms and a Caesar salad and get off your nuts. And it's exactly, it's pretty much the same sort of response that you have to LSD. I've done both. Yeah. And Magic Mushrooms was a lot milder an experience. So, uh, yeah, any any good mushroom guide will point out psilocybin mushrooms. So if you are a bit depressed, they've proved it, it will lighten it up. Try and do some with one other person in the room so you don't do anything stupid. And don't go outside shopping with any money in your pocket. If you are going to do magic mushrooms, because you will spend a fuck of a lot of money on nothing important. Sit down and listen to Sergeant Peppers or some shit. Because that's what it was designed for. That whole yep. album is an LSD trip. So yeah. I've never done it. Never done LSD. I want to do it at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, so uh, magic mushrooms. Yeah. Get yourself a mushroom field guide. Go up onto a big bit of moorland where they occasionally gra graze cows in about September. You'll find them. They grow naturally. They occur naturally. Mm -hmm. They don't require nice. any special environment. Off you wander. They're very thin stalk, little, um, yeah. almost like an isosceles triangle cap. And when you break them off, the tips where you've broken them go slightly blue. Don't do more than about, say, 15 on your mm -hmm. first go, but it will change your mood. Yeah. But, yeah. So uh, they grow naturally. Yeah. The government's are dicks for, for, I mean, imagine 
knowing this, like we've known it for 50 years, and letting someone go through 30 years of depression. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just disgusting. Uh, the punishment for which should be having I am a heartless wanker tattooed on your forehead. Hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Over to you, man, with the next story. Yeah. Um, Okay, so Yale's College will no longer bear the name of a slaver. From now on, it's the Grace Murray Hopper College. Yale's Calhoun College was named for the South Carolina Carolina politician John C. Calhoun, a Yale alum and notorious enslaver and advocate of slavery. This was, understandably, controversial. After years of wrangling and public pressure, Yale has renamed the college for Real Admiral Grace Hopper, a, quote, a trailblazing computer scientist, brilliant mathematician and teacher, and dedicated public servant, end quote, who is also a Yale alumnus. Yale's administration initially restricted calls to change the name, saying it would obscure the university's legacy. Many other universities with colleges and buildings named after white supremacists and secessionist traitors have long since renamed them. Uh, Sal- Salove? Salove made the uh, decision with the university's board of trustees, the Yale Corporation, in its most recent meeting. Quote, the decision to change the name is not when we take lightly, but John C. Calhoun's legacy as a white supremacist and national leader who passionately promoted slavery as a positive good fundamentally conflicts with Yale's mission and values. I have asked uh, John Ho- Jonathan Holloway, Dean of Yale College, and Julia Adams, have Calhoun College, to determine when this change best can be put into effect. End quote. The decision overrides uh, Salovey's announcement in April of last year that the name of the Calhoun College would remain. It's pretty good, man. Pretty good for. Uh, it is good. I mean, it, getting it, rid of to not not naming things after fucking twats. Yeah. Um, After you massive know, jerks. It's just it, it just sort of like amazes me that it takes till 2016 to go, mm, slavery's bad. You know, yeah. I mean, slavery's one of those things that you can only make work if you've got organised religion around. Because if those people didn't for a mm. moment, didn't which, which, deep down believe they were going on to a better place, those people would be killing those people that were enslaving them straight away. You wouldn't fuck around. If you thought this was my only life yeah. to live... And somebody is impinging on that, um, then uh, you know. And I, I have to ask permission to get married, and I am essentially chattel. That only works if you've got Christianity or some mm-hmm. shit involved, because the moment you say I might not have an afterlife, is the moment you've got to go. I must kill this white bastard who's put me in shackles. You know. Yeah. This is the why. This is why atheists are so fucking angry all the time, folks. Because <laughs> we're, you know, our lives are being <laughs> fucked around with, and it's not like we're going on to a better place. You know, that's it. It goes dark. So yeah, you know, sort of like, well, we've still got Ro- the Ro- Rhodes College in Oxford. And initially, when um, I heard the story of the guy that was at Rhodes College on a scholarship that demanded that the statue of Cecil Rhodes be taken down, I thought that was a bit much, mm-hmm. given that the guy was. May, basically getting a university education on the back of those investments but you know what yeah no I don't think we should give any sort of honour no to anybody that thinks it's okay to fuck with other people you know no, or, exactly. or manipulate don't them in any way much less way. somebody that promoted slavery and, and you know um, Calhoun was a white supremacist and that's not okay and um, Cecil Rhodes was the person that decided yeah. that Africa was basically his, hence Rhodesia. You know, yeah. uh, if you're going to name a college, you know, Pretty you might much. as well name it. I mean, what we're doing now, using computers to stay to use communication and get get this news out there, is down to Grace Hopper in part. You know, she she basically yeah. developed high level computer languages that made it remotely possible to program a computer yourself. So all the software we're using, from Mumble to Linux to even Windows, um, the word processing software we're using, the filing systems that we're using that use real names for files and shit like that, that's all down to Grace Hopper. You know, and it, and it, and it, uh, it really amazes me that you know women are finding it really hard to get on in STEM professions, given that they did most of the footwork before it became fashionable to be a computer programmer. Yeah. They were all women. 
I mean, computer programmer was a similar job to well, secretary. Well, it was secretarial work, yeah. near enough, wasn't it? Yeah. All, yeah. The, all the people that programmed... I, the, need, I need it to do this. You, you go and make it do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and computer meant a woman that would tap in numbers into a computer. The first ones in the UK were at the Lions Tea yeah. Shop chain, where Leo was the first... Um, yep. The Lions electronic um, organiser... So the first supercomputer is in a sense in a sense was running tea shops in this country. And it was where all the computer yeah. science stuff was taking place because they were trying to figure out how to make things more efficient. Nowadays it's unthinkable that a large business wouldn't use computers to organise everything. Um, but at the time everybody was taking the piss saying, you know, oh, what does it do? It counts shillings and sixpences and allows a set of tea shops to run. <coughs> Whereas you just can't run any kind of business without a computer these days. It's just not possible. Yeah. So Grace Hopper is is the reason that computers are in our lives because it means that an ordinary person can sit down and say there isn't a computer program that does this the way I want it to do it. I shall now rewrite it. I mean, that's what led yeah. to Visicalc, essentially. Okay. You know, which is the first spreadsheet which allowed businesses to be you know more connected. So yeah. So yeah. So ah, uh, it's. Just the, the continuing, oh, their great legacy of leaving money for the education of people. Yeah, I don't think, you know, Calhoun was particularly invested in educating black people. You know, no. uh, or women. You know, so that's, you know, a good 60% of America just discounted. <laughs> you know. They left, they left money to educate men. Yeah. So white, white men. White men, essentially. Was. So, fuck them. Um, they don't get to be remembered. You know, yeah. it's, you know, I think you should remember that slavery exists and I don't think you should whitewash the history of it. I think, you know, it's quite okay to call it something no. different. Grace Hopper College is, is it, you know, the, the fact that it's a woman's name on the college, you know, makes it much harder for, de the, de you know, the denial of entry for women scientists and stuff like that. You know, and they should always remember exactly. that their college is founded on white slavers' money and, work to address that and work to you know start fixing it you know mm -hmm. even if you this just go good this would have really made the founder of this college turn in his grave good he's dead and we're glad <laughs> you know and why yep. not start off with that and move on and make things better and actually ask you know those people that are um, sort of excised from the ability to access that privilege what would make it work what would help mm-hmm because those are the only people that know how to make it work. You can't fix it from outside. Exactly. Because it's that's still privilege. No. Here is me. Here is my hand up to where yeah. I am. Doesn't work. How do we fix this? Works. <laughs> See, we turn that into a political thing. Yeah. yeah so well done us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> moving on. So the wealth uh, of the percent of the poorest Americans has just dropped in 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 a report, which is a big shocker. Not um, mm -hmm. the. New analysis of the World Income Database published by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Thomas Piketty and College from the Paris School of Economics and University College Berkeley describe a collapse of the share of US national wealth claimed by the bottom 50% of the country, down to 12% from 20% in 1978. <sighs> Fuck, that's, that's really bad. Along with an unsurprising drop in income for the that's poorest half of America. That means that 88% of all Americans' wealth is owned by the top 50%. That's not just yeah. a bit. That's insane. Um, and that's not, you know, so, so the authors contrast this situation with the UK, France and China, which amazingly found that income inequality is much less stark than in other countries. In France, the poorest 50% saw income growth of 39% over the same period, even though France has become more unequal. Um, Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, made waves in global policy circles by carefully quantifying the widening wealth gap by assembling 300 years worth of global economic data. Piketty hypothesized that the gap was due to the fact that market econ economies deliver, usually deliver higher dividends than growth. That is, markets make investors richer than innovators. So the richest people are more likely to be inheritors, not people who deliver growth through new processes and products. I know that's a duh thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that have the money, that give money to people so that new yeah. products make, they make more money. But yeah, that should be fairly people obvious. Make the most money. But it, it's a big fucking book that capital in the 21st century mm. what is depressing is that this should be these books should have like a 
a cliff notes at the front where you can read the book yeah that essentially says this is what i'm saying the remaining 90 percent of the book is how i know it so if you if you want to prove it yeah here's the rest of it here are the maths and here is the the gist of it now interestingly the only person that's mm-hmm. ever done that properly um was Werner von braun when he was talking about the ability to send right. a rocket to the moon he wrote a fiction story that's about 150 pages yeah. of people going to the moon here is how we did it and it's kind of in the fiction of how the rocket works generally and then the back 80 percent is all the maths yeah so literally Werner von braun wrote a textbook on how to go to the moon dressed up as fiction in a book called from the earth to the moon you can go look it up and in the back of it is all the maths of how to do it so anybody picking it up that had like you know some money and like a, a fairly yard, large yard to, to blow things up in could have gone to the moon because it was so pissed off with the mm-hmm. american government dicking about at it anyway i digress so to conclude yeah. we stress that global inequality dynamics involve strong and contradictory forces we observe observe rising top income and wealth shares in nearly all countries in recent decades but the magnitude of rising inequality varies substantially across country countries thereby suggesting that different country specific policies and institutions matter considerably high growth rates in emerging countries reduce between country inequality but this in itself does not guarantee acceptable within country inequality levels and ensure social sustainability of globalization access to more and better data is critical to monitor global inequality dynamics detail uh, and is a key building brick both to properly understand the present as well as the forces which will dominate the future and to design potential policy responses i.e. rich people are getting richer because they set the rules which is a no-brainer yep. but you know it's sort of like it takes a, a you know a really big report for somebody to actually be able to prove it so wealthy people are fucking mm-hmm. us end of provably wealthy people are fucking us yep. it's a bit like when we did that thing on the bank of england that report right. that 17 page document that said we invent money yeah and nobody read it 17 pages and, yeah. and five pages of that were charts so literally you could have sat down in any like lunch break and gone hmm we're being fucked <laughs> just like you can like, oh, yeah. flat out say it and, totally. uh, and it really bothers me that you can't have a like a you, the news that that was buried that's that was that uh, what was that that was in boing boing.net that wasn't on the bbc I didn't see it on the BBC, mm-hmm. and I, I went and had a look. It wasn't in the Guardian. It wasn't in, you know, it wasn't in any of our news channels. I don't remember hearing the bongs of the six o'clock news, and you know, bong. Rich people are fucking us. Bong. Rich people are still fucking <laughs> us. Bong. We can really yeah. prove now that rich people are fucking us. Here is the rest of the news. Oh, actually, the rest <laughs> of the news is kind of related to rich people fucking us, quite badly, and every day. Bong. You know what? You know, oh. yeah. You know, just like, oh, uh, just you know. I think that's why news news. I think they school news readers not to react to the news. I do hope they don't put me on the news yeah. when I do the Manchester BBC thing. Um, because ah, oh, because mm-hmm. I'm not sure I'll be able to do that. Wouldn't that be a great way to get escorted out of the building, though? <laughs> Should I? Should I? Because really, they're never going to give me a job. I've got to face it. I'm never going to be a BBC news presenter. I might ask him. Am I never yeah. going to be a new BBC news? Writer? Well, it's not really going to happen because you know you yeah, you don't really react well to bad news, Zach. Oh, okay. Um, well, okay. Uh, would you like to read the news? Yes, I'd love to. <laughs> Bong. Rich people are fucking us. Beep. Emergency off. off. <laughs> Because I did yeah. ask them. I went up, when they did the tour. They sort of said, "I so it said so. So how long have you got to cut off someone if they're on the phone and they they come in?" And she went, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, if someone kicks off on air, and it's like, well, we don't have any time. It's live." Mm-hmm. I went, "Okay, I'll remember that." And they looked at me funny, but they still gave me a shot. <laughs> that was stupid. <laughs> Rich people are fucking us. News at eleven. Oh, yep. You know. <laughs> Minimum income. Oh my gosh! Think of it. Think of it as guillotine insurance, because you've got to do something. Yeah. So yeah. So that's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's like you can't. I, I. How long is that sentence? That's a one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eight, nine, twenty. It's about a forty-five word sentence. 
Yeah. So I I did it in five. Rich people are fucking us. <laughs> That's it. That's it like that. Buffy, yeah. you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, best ever quote. What are you doing here, Spike? In five words or less. Is it? Out for a walk, bitch. Oh. <laughs> and it's yeah. just like... <laughs> oh, it's just like, wow. Uh, yeah. Oh. That's that's really all there is in the news. Oh, and there's stuff to distract you. Uh, Brad Pitt's haircut's changed or some shit yeah. like that. Or Johnny Depp now has an eyebrow piercing. But, uh, yeah, rich people are still fucking mm. us. Yeah, uh, that's what's going on. Yep, over to you, man. Yeah, so uh, Donald, Tripp's, Donald Trump's trip to the UK will be delayed to avoid embarrassing him, according to reports. The visit will be postponed until sometime between late August and end of September, according to a report from The Guardian. Uh, that will mean that it can be held while Parliament is in recess and MPs <laughs> are not, allowed, not around to embarrass the President by objecting to him. You have a short visit between uh, Sunday and Thursday, according to the report. It's unlikely he'll spend much time in London because of the huge protests that are expected to greet him. Westminster is all already being filled with numerous protests against Mr. Trump's Muslim ban, as well as his presidency in general. Uh, the trip was initially initially been scheduled to happen around June, according to a comment from the London Police Chief last week. It has also been suggested that the government might look to move the visit away from London as a way of avoiding protests, but politicians and activists have warned the president that he will not ex- be able to escape escape the biggest protest in British history, no matter where the trip gets moved to. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> that needs to happen. It, uh, Donald Trump can fuck himself. He needs to be protest wherever he goes. And it's... I can't believe it. It's like Theresa May is cozying up to him, saying, oh, no, he's going to be great. We know why you're cozying up to him, Theresa May. It's because you fucked us all on Brexit. <laughs> You've said it's going to be a hard Brexit. There's going to be no, no, none of us staying in the single market. You've just gone, right, we're out. So what else have you got to fall back on but the United States? And you're cozying up to him because you want that quick and easy trade deal with the United States. So we're not fucked as a country. Well, f- fuck you for cozying up to a fucking fascist leader. I'm sorry, I, I oh Donald Trump really. I thought me that off. was the one that was going to make me kick off more. The, but the yeah. only <laughs> solace, the only solace, right? The only solace is he's probably going to fucking die in like the next two years from all the stress. He, apparently, he's only getting like four hours of sleep a night. Well, that's more than most presidents because get because he's so stressed. Have you seen the before and after pictures of Barack? He's Obama? like seventy years old though. Barack Obama's grey yeah, now, but and he's a chilled he's out like dude. The oldest... No. He's not the oldest president ever, but he's the currently the oldest to have assumed office. Mm. Essentially, he's the only person age seventy to have assumed. Sorry, to have assumed office at age seventy. You know, yeah. and he, apparently he hates it. This visit because gonna be he can't huge. do anything. He's got so much work. He can't. He can't just sit behind a desk and people bring him things and he just signs papers like he normally does. You know, it, it, like Donald Trump's day usually consists of him lifting a pen. Can't do that anymore. He has to do. He has to actually do work. Although he's shirking that now to go play golf, like yeah. four weekends in a row. And he and he had the gall to have a go at Obama for taking for going out on a golf trip once. Yeah. Fucking privileged twat. On the plus side, I mean, I liked President Obama. Oh he was God. he was completely blocked on a lot of cases, but Donald Trump makes President Obama look like shaft. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. You know, you know, he's, you know, he really does. President Obama looks like the Richard Roundtree of presidents. I, 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 you know, Obama could have got away with wearing a leather suit to work. Who's the president that's got everybody's back? <laughs> yeah, Obama. Yeah, that's damn right. Obama. <laughs> back. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh. He's one me, mother. Hush your mouth. It's all oh. cold, cold. I'm talking about back. Shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen uh, Michelle, Ob- Michelle Obama's carpool karaoke? No. Oh, you got to see James Corden and Michelle Obama. <sighs> she is cool. She is as cool as he is. Oh, mm. uh, it's really funny. Pre- uh, Michelle Obama singing all the single ladies with James Corden and uh, <laughs> and Missy Elliott in oh, the back. I'll have to check that out. Oh, it is the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen. Oh, I am going to have to check that out. <laughs> it is. I am going to check that out. Oh, it is just absolutely mint. And it's just like, wow. And they, I think they've both yeah. gone, yeah, you voted for a fascist. We're out of here. And, you know, good fucking riddance. But, yeah. 
But I mean, how how are yeah. you gonna? It's gonna be like I think it's, it's gonna be like steering Donald Trump round, you know, trying to sell real estate to somebody on a landmine. Well, this way, Mr. Trump, look out of this window, not not yeah. the other window, Mr. Trump, because there are loads of really angry fucking people outside, hoping that the only reason they don't want you dead is because mm-hmm. Mike Pence will then be president. That is what's keeping you alive. You see, the problem is right. You see, the problem is, is, is anywhere he goes, right? Anywhere he goes, there will be a flash mob of people who just turn up, right? And I'm, you know, the best thing to happen, and I'm not setting up for one second saying that people should do this. I am not for one second saying that people should do this. But one of the best things that could happen would be if everyone took like a 12 pack of eggs (laughs) and pelted, pelted him. His limousine, Mike Pence. If that twat's there, well, leave, leave, so leave the security guys alone. You know, leave, leave special service alone. Leave everyone else alone. Mm. Just aim for the limousine and Trump. It's a big target. Give that, that fucking limousine. toast-faced twat <laughs> a good tar- Good show. Show him what we do in this country. Show him what we do to people we hate in this country. Throw eggs at him. Hmm. Oh, man, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, he boils my blood. He does. It's, it's also the people behind him. Oh I mean, my gosh. You know, all the people he's appointed are the like the least. Yeah, no, Mike qualified. Pence. Is like, Mike Pence, Steve Bannon. These like fucking. Oh god. What's the name? Devos, who doesn't believe. Who's basically trying to get science taken out of all American schools. She and, admitted, Bet, Bet, uh, Betsy Betsy Devois, I think yeah. it is right. She admitted. After getting her position, that she paid her way in. Wow. She 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 said, yeah, no. Uh, they, it was asked of her. You've you've support you've um supported Trump's campaign with a lot of money. And she said, no, oh no, it wasn't for this. And then as soon as she got the job, hmm. she said, oh, I'm tired of hiding anymore. Yes, I did do the. I did pay for this role. Wow. I don't want to hide this anymore. I paid money to Trump, and I expected a return. Wow. She bought her role. Yeah. That's, that's astonishing. I mean, yeah, they all bought their roles. But yeah, to just flat out say it. But it's not yeah. going to make any difference, is it? That's the scary thing. You can flat out say. Oh. No. Wow, yeah. that's that's rather incredible. It's really... That's just insanity, isn't it? It is. It really is. I, it really yeah. is, man. And the and the, the the guy who's running the EPA wanted to close down the EPA at one point. It's atrocious! It really is. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, you've... it really is terrible. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I've got. It's just mind blowing. You know, all everything that's happening in politics. You know, everything's yeah. imploding. You know, I'm really thinking that the you know that our, our subject for discussion is is going to help because I think that's a solution. I might have to just set that up and get that rolling. That could be real fun. So if anybody, I wants think to we might have to. I think we should Patreon found some MPs. I think, I think well, we might have to put that off till next time. Actually, yeah, because we're running we're running close on time. Okay, so we got our halftime music. So uh, we got uh, the first casualty by the Divisionists. Which is another single from Shameless Promotion, mm-hmm. from their LP Daybreak, and people make people make people by Screaming Love Collective, courtesy of German Shepherd Records. So I'm just <laughs> going to stop the recording so we can play that, and I'll be back in just a second. Streets. 
Um, and have you got a scoop? I, I have got to be like getting. I've got to. No, not now. All right. But in like 20 minutes, I have to be getting okay. ready to go. So, so is there anything you wanted to quickly run over put a on the time discussion? Limit on, well, what I was going to say is rather than putting a time limit on the discussion, mm. why don't we intro that that bit of the Lavu recording? Oh, yes. That's a very good idea. I have. I, you'll have to send it. Again. If we just throw that in, mm. you'll need to. Um, yeah, no, I'll send, send it again to you. Yeah. So, because uh, I've it, it died. I think that didn't PC. I, I sent you a link. Of, oh, and of course you. Mm. Everything I, on that you, PC was gone. Oh, it should still be in that. No, it should still be in that email that I sent you. Oh, 
Okay, well, I'll see if I can grab it. But um, yeah, that, yeah. So this week's discussion, we would have liked to have done politics, but time has beaten us, and we I'll want to get something again. out to you. If you uh, send me the link again, well, um, yeah. I got interviewed by Kevin is a geek um, about living off grid. So that's our emergency discussion because we, we we've both had very interesting weeks as far as running out of time, which is why there has been a two week gap. And I'll plug that in instead. Um, so this is a. Uh, a, a quick piece of um, audio that we recorded years ago while I was living in a teepee or a lavu more effectively and uh, yeah we'll put that in and uh, we'll do the dis- we'll do a political discussion next week um, yeah yeah definitely so that's our second recording so that will play now is there a defining event that pushed you to live off grid yeah um, largely as a result of going wild camping quite a lot and spending most of my time, most of my free time when I wasn't working out in the woods, um, I realised that I didn't need as much stuff. Um, but that that didn't really sort of make me think, I'm going to go and live off grid. But one day I was at work and we'd worked really, really hard for about 12 hours. And my manager sent me a snotty email saying that you guys need to work harder after working my guts out. And I questioned it with him and he, and the, he used the magic phrase, you do choose to work here, implying that any grief that was coming my way, I had accepted as part of my contract with them. And, and after that day, I went wild camping again, and I sat in the woods and thought for a couple of days and realized that if I lived off grid, I wouldn't need as much income so I could do pretty much any other job. What was your last day in civilization like? Um, my last day at work, because I spent, I had to give them the, my employees a month's notice. So during that month, I started boxing up all the possessions I thought I would take with me off grid and getting rid of other stuff. Um, so it, there was a long build up to it. I didn't have a last day in civilization and walk up the road with a pack and say, that's it, fuck it. There was a bit of planning going into it. So yeah, it was pretty liberating looking around at things for the last time and realizing that that, you know, that was the last bill I was gonna pay. These are the last moments of hassle I'll have as a result of my job. So yeah, there were, there were little golden moments. I did uh, sit in my office space, which was surrounded by glass, so it's quite soundproof, playing take this job and shove it from office space really loud in the cubicle. So when somebody walked in, all they could hear on the computer speakers was take this job and shove it. That was fun. How much is your power usage? Um, well, the power usage is really surprising, given that most people had to spend about £60 a month on electricity, um, just on a sort of like a smallish house, just one person will, will spend around that. Um, my power usage has gone down to uh, my last power bill, which was a winter one. Cost I spent six pounds ninety four on electricity, and then another fifteen pounds on standing charge over a quarter. So it works out at about eight pounds a month. So a significant saving. What expenses do you have? Um, well, there's rent on the plot that I rent, so that's about fifty quid a week. Um, you've got standard food, which I guess is the same, you know, as if you were living in a house. But I generally tend to bulk buy from Asian supermarkets whenever I can. Um, there's also sort of like some local farmers that supply cheaper food if you can store it in bulk, like eggs and bacon and stuff. Um, yeah, so your food cost is pretty normal. Um, you've, because under UK law, you can't really be charged council tax unless you have an address or a tent. So there's no council tax. That's another £50 a month I don't have to find. Um, that's about it. Oh, internet. I don't really have a bill for internet as such. And I probably spend less on it. But then I have to use, you know, um, a sort of mobile broadband. So I use less of that because I'm aware of how much I'm using. Um, telephone's about the same, you know, because I use a mobile phone. But that's about... Those are really... Oh, gas. Um, the, the average household spend per quarter on gas is around £200 per quarter. I've been here a year now and I've bought precisely two gas cylinders for cooking. Uh, now I've been here over a year, each gas cylinder is £27, so I've spent £54 on gas over a year, which drags it down to something less than a fiver a month. So yeah, it's significantly cheaper to live like this, but there are drawbacks and problems. How does spending money online work? Um, I don't. I no longer have a bank account because it was. I was. Over, I was massively overdrawn, and I realised that a bank account generally will incur charges, which on a massively reduced income 
about a third of what I was earning, I could not afford any, a single bank charge. Uh, but there are on there are cash cards that you can buy, so you can actually spend money online, or you can get in touch with a friend who's got a bank account, give them the cash, and they'll buy whatever it is you want, as long as you don't take the piss. If you're spending a lot of money online, regularly, you're going to want to get a cash card so you can take control of that. If you're only buying, say, one thing every couple of months, it's probably easier and cheaper to just get a friend to buy it and give them the cash. How do you make money? Um, I now work for, uh, I do a sort of cash in hand job, working a few hours a week at a cafe, and that provides more than enough money for me to exist and function. What problems have you encountered and overcome? The winter was really cold. Um, it got down to minus 18 Celsius at one point. All the drinking water froze, so you had to continue to go out and buy bottled water and hope that you could use it before it you left it overnight and then it froze again or put it next to a wood burning stove. So the cold was a bit of an issue. Um, in American terms that's going to be zero degrees Fahrenheit or thereabouts. So it was excitingly cold. Cold enough for you, if you don't think for you to get frostbite. Um, other problems, your heating, you have to go and gather wood. You can't just sit around and do nothing all day. There's always tasks. Washing up is a bit more of a hassle. Laundry is a bit more of a hassle because you've got to heat water to do that. You really don't want to wash clothes in cold water in the middle of the winter because you won't be able to feel your fingers. So you have to heat up water where in a house I guess you just turn on a tap and get hot water. Uh, because of where I am I've got access to a shower and loos but again the loos froze so I had to resort to a portable toilet which wasn't too bad except that I had to put antifreeze into the flush system to stop the water in that freezing. Um, you have to pay attention to the skin of your dwelling if you're living under canvas. You have to make sure that it doesn't get damp, it doesn't get any mould. This is my second tent because the last one pretty much died because it had been up for over a year. So you have to continually be looking at what parts of your tent touch the ground, what parts of your tent don't get heated or a chance to dry out, all sorts of things. Um, you have to keep an eye on your wood burning stove to make sure that the fuels that you're burning don't produce sparks so because the spark will come out the top of the fluid wood burning stove and if it's still hot enough i.e. if you're burning pine wood which is the easy, most easily available wood which is really annoying um, it will eat a hole through the top of your tent therefore it's no longer waterproof so you get drips and stuff on you if you allow sections of you know basically if you leave holes in in your tent without fixing them you're going to get your stuff wet and if you're living like I do with a fair amount of electronic equipment then you really, really will quickly find that leaving the electronic equipment in a damp environment will kill some of it. I don't think I've lost anything. I don't think anything's died on me. No, uh, nothing's actually died. A phone died, but it was a second-hand phone and it was going to die anyway, but it didn't die as a result of the damp. Um, if you don't pay attention to things getting wet, if you've got things touching the sides of your tent, they will soak up moisture. If you don't watch how your ground sheet is laid out, whether it's in a dip in the ground, it will pool and a, like, when it really chucks it down, you'll get a pool of water in your tent, which will be, which will, unless it's really hot the next day, it won't dry out or it will freeze if it's really cold. So you tend to run little checks around your equipment and stuff like that. You make sure that nothing angular touches the tent because if it gets any rot at all, something angular is leaning up against it, it will just push a massive great big gap in the tent. So you become very paranoid about your dwelling because it will cost many hundreds of pounds to replace it, even second hand, to get a decent sized canvas tent. Um, you can't really cook in a canvas tent so you need like a secondary tent in which to cook. So that's a bit of a hassle when you just fancy some, you know, something quick and easy. You have to go into another tent to cook that. or um, But you can get like a little portable cooker to just boil a kettle and you know, do yourself some sort of noodles if you just want a snack. Um, when it snows you really don't want to go anywhere, when it's really dark you tend to go to sleep. So I tend to, you know, in the middle of winter you tend to go to bed when it's dark. If your heating isn't at the push of a button you have to build a fire and maintain it so about every 20 minutes you have to get up from what you're doing, put more wood or coal on the, fire, on the wood burning stove. Yeah, loads of things. You tend to learn stuff by not doing it and suffering as a result. You tend to get your best fuel mix by not having a good mix of fuel and trying out various things. It's quite easy to run out of in the middle of winter something that will light your fire very quickly. So 
you have that problem, you realise that you ran out of something and it was too far away for you to go and get easily. So, because we're out in a very rural environment, buses are a bit of a hassle. Um, yeah, so overcome your problems by stocking up, listening to other people that have done it. Make it, you know, doing spot checks on things like at least once a day to make sure that something hasn't been pushed back and you're not aware of it. And then is le making like a really big dent in the canvas material of your tent because it, it will kill it. That's about it. I, um, I do plan to do a whole off-grid series and this is just an introduction to that. So we will be going through that in a bit more detail. But you learn to pay attention to little things that can cause you a problem in the long run. How do you feel your standard of living has gone? I don't think my standard of living has changed all that much. Um, still got internet, still got plenty of IT kit, um, musical instruments, loads of books, which I'm slowly thinning down. The only problem is space. Um, that's really just about the only problem that I have, because you've got so much less space. You're going from, I'm, I was going from a two bedroom house to five by five meters. So, you, you know, you're talking very little or no furniture. You're talking um, thinning out your clothes. If you haven't worn it in a year, you've got, you tend to get rid of it. If you haven't used anything in six months, you tend to look at it and go, do I really need it? Um, yeah, oh, I've got all the amenities. I'm cooking pretty much as well, if not better than I did before. I'm eating a lot better. I'm eating, making sure I'm looking after myself a lot more because you really don't want to be ill in a tent, not, especially not in the depths of winter. So yeah, it's about the same. I've got, most months I've got about the same amount of disposable cash. But because you can't really buy anything, everything you look at has got to fit into your new existence. It tends to be commodities rather than things that you're going to buy and keep. So yeah, it's about the same. But there again, I'm living in a static environment where I can stay here for a very long period of time. I'm not having to pack it up and move it. If I had to pack it up and move it every so often, then I'd have a lot less stuff and that would limit what I could do in my spare time. Because believe me, in the winter, you just want to veg. If you're not actually working, you tend to make sure that you've got enough wood for your, for your heating. You tend to cook a, a batch of meals at a time and then you tend to hunker down because it's too cold to do very much else. So unless you want your fire on 24 seven, which means you've got to process more wood, you tend to make sure that you've got a big stack of entertainment or things that you can literally lie in bed and do. So audio books, movies, videos and stuff like that. That tends to be pretty much what you do in the winter. So your, your standard of living, you tend to laze about a lot more in the winter, you tend to do a lot more active stuff in the summer. But really, in real terms, that's what I did when I was in a house. So not no real change. I don't feel that I'm missing anything by living in a tent. What fuels do you use and how do you cook? I currently use a an, a, like a two burner camping stove with a grill for most things and that runs on propane. Um, I've got a couple of little flat barbecue grills for in the tent when it's in the middle of winter and I can't be bothered to get up just to boil water for coffee So and they use butane but butane's really not that good in the winter. It's a really a last ditch thing if I really can't be bothered to get up I'll use a butane canister primarily because butane only operates to about minus five degrees Celsius which is about, it's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. So that's for cooking. You tend, you, I'll, I would prefer, prefer to go to my butane stove and cook on that, but you really can't have your butane stove in the same area that you sleep in, purely because it has to be up against one of the tent walls. This is a lavu, which is a kind of teepee with a central pole. So the walls are really steep and it eats up a huge amount of space. You also can't stand next to it while you're cooking. So you have to kneel down while you cook, so you tend to not cook anything very exciting. Which is why I decided to put it back in the kitchen tent, even for winter. Fuel-wise, for heating, it's mainly, um, I've, I've found out that the optimum fuel combination is sawdust briquettes, which are made out of carpenter sawdust compressed under a two or three ton pressure. Um, and they're very cheap, they're about they're 10 kilos for 3 quid, which is 10 kilos for 5 dollars, but you only use 3 or 4 to get the fire going, with a fire lighter underneath that, with coal, which is also pretty cheap, and on top of that, um, hardwood, which as I live in a thousand acres of woodland isn't really very hard to come by. So processed hardwood on top of coal and briquettes with a fire lighter to get it going, 
will keep the fire going for hours. So you don't really have to top it up that much. Um, to stock up for the entire winter would cost me, including gas, coal, briquettes, wouldn't cost me any more than £150. So less than $200 will be my entire winter fuel and I will be very well supplied with fuel for the whole winter. I, I should have about a third of that left over by the time the weather warms up. Um, that's about it. I don't think I use it. Um, I've got a couple of petrol lanterns just in case the power goes out. Um, so a couple of quid's worth of petrol. We'll see those running for days, for weeks really, just to provide light. And because it's, I've got the fortunate that I've got mains electricity that's connected to me via the sort of electricity hookup that caravans use. So I've got three main plugs on that, off which come, you know, a couple of extension cords, and that runs everything in the tent and everything in the kitchen tent because you need light to cook by in the winter. And I recently. I know it sounds like a major luxury, I recently acquired a freezer, but that allows you to cut down on food bills and we'll see, I don't know how much that's going to cost me per week, but it's worth having because you can keep a lot of food on hand, frozen, ready to use. Do you have any pets and how have they adapted to your new situation? When I moved here I had a cat and I was very worried that in a massive, massively large woodland environment where he could just take off if he wasn't happy, whether he'd just get lost or something like that. Cause he, Historically, it wasn't very very street smart, but it took him about two days to get used to the environment, and then, yeah, he was fine. He, he really enjoyed going hunting and stuff like that. Unfortunately, about a month ago, he had a stroke and died, but he was about 10 years old, at least, because I don't know how old he was when he got it. And then, very weirdly, a week later, I found an abandoned cat in the woods where I live, and I've managed to sort of like, um, well, reintroduce him to an environment where he's quite happy and relaxed. So cats especially, okay, because you can leave a cat on its own and if the cat's happy with the environment, he'll stay. If he's not happy with the environment, he's gonna just do one and leave. But both cats seem to have had a really good time. My next door neighbors have two dogs and a cat and the dogs are happy enough to take themselves off for a walk. Only they don't even have official walk times anymore. They just go for a wander. And they can wander for, a, for nearly three miles in one direction and not see another person. And you generally find them at some point, give a whistle and they'll come, they'll come running. Even the cat, when I whistled, would uh, just immediately scoot over to the tent to see what was up. So yeah, pets. I don't think you really want caged pets like ferrets or rats or mice or anything in this environment <clears throat> because if they got out, there are so many predators you never see them again. And also the smell in a teepee if you had think, something that did require an awful lot of cleaning. You wouldn't really want to clean out a ferret every two days in the winter. So cage pets, you really don't want an aquarium, but something independent like a cat seems to adapt to this environment really well. Advice for those thinking of trying the lifestyle? If you were thinking of living under canvas, and, and I have to be specific here, off-grid can mean so many different things. You could be in a house with all sorts of power options. You could have um, propane heating and stuff like that. I've got no experience of that. If you wanted to live under canvas off-grid, you need to find somewhere that, some, that the landowner is prepared for you to be there for about a month without really worrying too much. You need to figure out whether you can have electricity on tap, whether you can have a water supply nearby that's safe for drinking. So if you could find somewhere like I've got where I've got water is included in my rent, where you've got electricity and you want to try it out, um, you want to pick somewhere close to so that you can commute to your job because you might not want to quit your job and you want to try it out for a month in the summer and see how that goes and then a month in the depths of winter so like January and then go home and have a think about it I don't I adapted well to it because I'd already had a winter while camping so it wasn't too much of a stretch to, it was essentially wild camping with a lot more comfort. So it was a, it was a grade up from how I was spending my, all my spare time. Whereas if you're going straight from a house with no experience of being outside all the time and no understanding of how weather can change and make you miserable if you're not prepared for it, then you really want to do a month in the summer, see how you feel about the deprivations that you'd have to undergo um, in good weather and then do a month in the winter or start off a week in the winter and see how you cope and see how you feel about it and then do a month and then stretch it. I'd say do it gradually if you're going to do it. 
because if you're unlikely to have the backup that I had, I've got neighbours who live like that all year round. If I've got a question, I can literally go next door and ask, how do you do this? And get a straight answer. The one thing you do learn is that you'll be told how to do something, you'll do it another way and then realize it, you'll have to learn by doing it. But if at least if you're, somebody tells you how they do it, you've got the thing to try after your first initial plan. So yeah, I, I'm, I've been really lucky in that I've got the, the, the ideal environment and the best neighbors in the world to, to, try, to try going sort of like, well, it's not really off grid because you know I pay for gas, it gets delivered. I pay, admittedly, a much less for electricity, and it's just there. So you, you gotta, you got to make up your own mind of whether that's off-grid or not. So, but yeah, if you can have the ideal environment, do two months, but each month six months apart, and then make a decision. If, you're, if, you, if you feel that you've got no choice than to go off-gridding, and you've only got a finite time to find out whether you're going to do it, or you, you want to do it, or you have to buy enough equipment so you'll have to stop paying rent, start in the winter starting like February and then it's not usually the worst ever weather it is cold and you'll get used to that you'll get used to running a wood-burning stove you'll get used to how you're gonna heat the tent or caravan or whatever you decide to move into I can't recommend caravans primarily because they tend to send people a bit stir-crazy of the two people that have been in this where where, where I am in a, in a small two-birth caravan both of them got very very depressed even though there were lots of people around to sort of like, you know, tell them how to do stuff, they found it very, very depressing. And I think it's a much smaller environment as well, even than a, than a five meter lavu. Um, if you're gonna, yeah, if you're gonna, gonna start in February, the weather is only gonna get better. So as you get through your first month and you're gritting your teeth and you're just a, adapting to your environment, it's already March. It's already warmer, might be a bit wetter, but wet is better than freezing cold in some instances because you, you can get warm you can dry out everything you haven't got a layer of snow over everything so yeah I'd say if you're, you've only got one shot at doing it and you're going to do it and burn a few bridges when you go do it in February because then you, you're at least the, the year's going to improve but you will already be used to the cold weather but if you've got the time if you've got a year to make up your mind one, one month in summer one month in winter Is there anything that has happened that has almost pushed you back to normality? No, it's really good. Uh, you know, but there again, I've got neighbours and stuff like that. Nothing has happened to make me think, God, I wish I lived in a house. I think because I'm one of those people that likes to be able to look at something and be able to fix it there and then. I'm not really into any level of technology I've got to rely on that I can't fix. So if you're living under canvas, you can repair it, you know, most holes in a canvas tent with copy decks and another piece of canvas. Um, you know, if you're really stuck up against it, all canvas tents come in canvas bags. If you've got to repair a hole, cannibalize the bag. Get a tube of copy decks, smear the copy decks over the canvas and do it. My water supply is a, you know, a 25 litre jerry can. Now my gas supply is a bottle of gas. If anything, there's nothing that can go wrong with my cooking system. The stove is cast iron, that's never going to break. You know, all these things are completely bomb-proof. So all the basic resources, like if you're going to rely on a porter loop, you're responsible for your own sewage. That's never going to back up. You can always get round it. You can always find a solution, even if it's digging a hole and pouring the, air, the effluent in and then filling the hole back in again. You've always got direct control over everything you absolutely rely on. So no, I, pr I much prefer it to living in a house. And, uh, right, so we, should we just go through the Recomedia and the links? Yeah, we should go through the Recomedia, yeah. yeah. So um, I'll do the Recomedia then. Okay. So there's a video here for a, uh, um, a link. The link's been provided. Um, one of a new method of um, knife sharpening. Which looks really good, by the way, if you want to get like that razor sharp edge. I'm not really super keen on super razor sharp edges. Because um, I, I just think that they fade and you notice mm -hmm. quicker. Like reasonably sharp is good. Uh, razor sharp is kind of one of those things that it makes you not want to use your knife for doing stuff. So, but it is interesting, and that channel is yep. well worth watching. Um, it's called um, the uh, the Way of Weapons, or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and he makes all sorts of yeah. homemade weaponry from sort of like really cheap. And he also does things on how to make aluminium forges and shit like that for fuck all money for like 20 quid. Oh, nice. So it's like home forging and, and weapon manufacture and crossbows and shit like that. He does, he's done loads of videos. His output's dropped off now, but there's lots of back stuff to listen to. Okay. And there's a uh, another one, Home Power Tools, from yeah. the same channel. Is it the same channel? Uh, I think yeah. it says um, channel as above. Oh, right. That might yeah. be, yeah. Oh, it's just, it's just a link to the channel itself, actually, mm. that one. There's a second one. So the it first might, one's a, it might first be. I link might have is got that for um, a new weapon and knife sharpening. Mm. The second one is the actual channel. Yeah. Uh, the Art of Weapons. Ah, there we go. And then there's a video uh, provided by Digital Whiskey mm. um, of John Ronson talking about public shaming. Yeah, um, uh, which is interesting. It's sort of like somebody does something that's sort of like we frown on. And then it, it, that's just it. Their mm -hmm. life's over in the public domain. But Donald Trump, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we, we get distracted into this like huge public outcry over a, a misspelled word. And that may well be a, a, a thing, but there doesn't seem to be any ability to rehabilitate people or to for them to say, right, I totally learned that that was a stupid fucking thing to say or think. But that, that doesn't yeah. fix it. You know, yet you can have people that just continually do mean shit all over the world and they get away with it and everybody goes, well, at least they're a strong person. It's like, no, oh, it's fucked up. So it's a really interesting mm -hmm. thing. And uh, initially I thought, well, there should be a public outcry when somebody does something. Like that woman who tweeted, uh, who sent that email saying, today would be a good wet day to bury any bad news on 9-11. And that's it. Her political yeah. career was completely over. Now that was a, a kind of a, a, you know, a blunt thing to say. But to be honest, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm surprised that only one person said it. But that person got pilloried. You know, somebody said yeah. something out of turn, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Their career is over. Yet other people can literally just continue doing evil shit. And it doesn't harm their public persona any at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I, 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 was, I, was, I was more or less in, with each of those trying to just explain why they were there. But yeah, that's an interesting one, and it possibly will change your opinion about some things. But uh, yeah. Um, so the links mm -hmm. this week, um, there's a, an article from Kevin, um, about how to cook rice and the levels of arsenic that are found in rice generally, which I'd never heard of. Yeah. Um, and it's specifically the way I cook rice Sorry. is the worst way to cook rice. Um, but these are levels of arsenic rather than a lethal level of arsenic. I think if the way most of the world cooks rice was actually it's lethal, traces. you know, that would be half the planet gone. Well over half the planet uses uses and cooks yeah. rice exactly that way, and well over half the planet has rice as their staple instead of bread. So you know it's not like lethal, but it, uh, link arsenic is linked to dementia and also and, so, and lots and lots of cancers. So that could explain why yeah. cancer has risen as a number one cause of death, and why Alzheimer's is affecting nearly everybody. People just don't get old and just sort of like keep all their shit together mm -hmm. until they die. A lot now, they you know, slowly fade, and that could be to the amount of arsenic that's used in staple foods. So we need to look into that and maybe come mm -hmm. up with a, with a comprehensive response to that. I mean, from a prepper point of view, soaking rice overnight is a really good idea because it saves you a shitload of fuel. So if you've already well, yeah, soaked the rice, so it's already rice, it's already edible without using any fuel, that's a good thing, which is a, a, another benefit from it. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a film school guy film school's guide to filming protests um which is a thing called oh god i had it here it's the no film school which is if you yeah. want to document things they've got lots of things on that so i think you've accidentally put the wrong link in there have i oh shit yeah yeah, yeah i think that. i have <laughs> I need to fix that link, but yeah, that was pretty interesting. I hope it's not yeah. anything true embarrassing. Oh, that's the John Ronson one again. No, it was, you just you yeah. copied the John Ronson one. Yeah. I thought I'd double check it. Uh, anyway, yeah, so as always, we always want links. We always want stuff. I'm sorry, but we did definitely lose a few good links on stuff. There were some links about um, Ms. Devoir. I like Devos, though, because you only have to add an I. Or a, a U. Devious. Mm-hmm. An I and a U. 
I yeah. can oh, turn yeah, that into devious. Um, yeah, so Mr. <laughs> what uh, Because Iron Angel's actually met her on a number of occasions. She lives right near he does. Really? So, yeah, and he knows her of old oh, wow. and how horrifying she can be. He was absolutely livid. For mm -hmm. a long, long time, there was a lot of... He was, as shouty as you can be in an IRC chat channel about that. And with good cause, I wow. went into it. And yeah, it's just scary as anything. So yeah, that's uh, that's going to wrap up our, oh, sorry, our show that. for today. Um, yeah, I'm sure he'll send it again once he listens to this. We have dropped the ball. Uh, my computer died. I had a whole week of shit going wrong. But thanks to Kevin, everything is up and running. So yeah, so that's the end. Of, that's pretty much the mm -hmm. end of the show. Our outro music is some chill out music because there were lots of things to get angry. If you've listened to the TP off grid living thing, you'll probably will have calmed down over the course of that. But me and me and Graffin are still angry as fuck. Yeah. So I've been V. <sighs> I've been Graffin. Yeah, and this is Galacticon by Amagama. Um, thanks to again to Shameless Promotion. It is just chill out music. I think I needed it. It's quite nice. And uh, yeah, so off grid music for off grid people. So uh, we'll get this out to you. This yeah. should be out by tonight. And thank you very much for listening. And please um, leave a like or some comments and stuff in the uh, YouTube thing. Or you can go and download this at archive.org. There will be a link in the YouTube extras if you want to go and download it and the running order, which will be collected, corrected by the time I get this. I'll have to mm -hmm. take out that link and resave that. Otherwise, it will be no good to you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, bye-bye and thank you again. Thanks, okay. guys. Okay. Next week, uh, we'll probably be more shouty and we'll have a bit more time. You know, um, our last episode was nearly three hours. <laughs> yep. Okay. I know. Bye. This is this is getting on close to two or something. It'll be uh, yeah, it'll be uh, bordering on two. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we yeah. we need to if we're going to do it weekly, we need uh, a more quick fire um, format so it's under an hour, so people can spare the time to yeah. read it. And maybe if there are if there is more stuff we want to do in that given week, uh, we we put out another show or something. But yeah, okay. Well, thank you again. Maybe um, no, no, I don't have nightmares. <laughs>
cruelty and injustice, intolerance and oppression. And where once you had the freedom to object, to think and speak as you saw fit, you now have sensors and systems of surveillance coercing your conformity and subverting your submission. We need cameras. How did this happen? Who's to blame? Well, certainly there are those who are more responsible than others, and they will be held accountable. But again, truth be told, if you're looking for the guilty, you need only look into a mirror. I know why you did it. I know you were afraid. Who wouldn't be? War, terror, disease. There were a myriad of problems which conspired to corrupt your reason and rob you of your common sense. Fear got the best of you, and in your panic you turned to the now High Chancellor Adam Sutler. He promised you order, he promised you peace, and all he demanded in return was your silent, obedient consent.